<laughs> anyway, um, so I'm going to read you a Taoist poem. Uh, that's the bulk of my talk, but I'm also going to reference one of my favorite pieces in the world, the Xin Xin Ming, and I think they dovetail beautifully. And the title, Now You See It, Now You See It, refers directly to the poem and what the poem does with what the poem calls companions, which I just love, companions. It's just great. So um, I want to tell a story about kindness. Uh, I was listening to the Moth Radio Hour last sun Saturday, and it's about a young, she's, she, she, you know, she's young, she has a band now, she lives in Houston, and at the time, she'd finished college, and she'd gone, she moved to Thailand to teach English. People do that. So this story is, as I said, she's a young woman, she goes off to Thailand to teach English. And uh, she flies into the airport in Bangkok and she sees a big sign on the hillside that says, Thailand, the land of smiles. And she construes that after having spent some time there. Are we still okay with audio? Let me know. Um, that, and after having, that this means you do not wear your heart on your sleeve. Uh, you do not let people know if you're just not feeling all that great about things. Um, negative emotions are not necessarily um, received uh, with um, magnanimity. I don't know, she didn't put it that way. Anyway, it gets to be Christmas time and she's homesick as hell. And she misses snow and I forget where she is, where she had come from, but she really misses snow. And she knows there's no snow in Thailand. And her roommate, who is Thai, sort of looks at her kind of askance and says, come with me. And they're used to taking long bike rides in the countryside. And this time they take a different route. And the roommate takes her. Um, on a, they turn off and they go up a hill. And when they get to the top of the hill, there's a gorgeous panoramic view of a lake. And they get off their bikes and the roommate urges her just to wait. And all of a sudden, this gorgeous white bird flies over the lake. Did you hear this? And lands on, on, the, on the hillside or on the other side of the lake. And all of a sudden there are just, there are just flocks and flocks, tens, dozens, hundreds, thousands of white birds just flying up over the lake and landing on the hillside. And it looks like snow. <laughs> and she's so grateful to her roommate for that kindness. And I don't wanna cry, <sighs> but I just thought that was the sweetest story. And another lovely part of the story that I thought was that as far as she knew, nobody knew why the birds flock there in such huge numbers, but apparently it was a regular occurrence, and that's how her Thai roommate knew about it. But she no longer felt so terribly homesick as she looked at the birds. That was not a stalling device. The last time Steve Hagen gave a talk here, he talked about karma, a greatly misunderstood word, which means very simply action. And he talked about karma, action, human action, and the Buddha's teaching on intention, which is one of the Buddha's two great insights uh, based on trusting the heart mind. It really was a wonderful talk about how trusting the heart mind is saturated with the teaching of human action. He, Interestingly, he avoided the term willed action as far as I can remember, but he cited many examples from the Xin Ching Ming of teachings pointing directly to what human action based on trying to bring something about is represented in the Xin Ching Ming. I am not revisiting that talk, but I am gonna talk some from the Xin Ching Ming first before I move to the poem. Um, and I'm just going to quote directly. We recite this, Xin Ming, trust in the heart mind, 
every other Friday night after the last 10 minutes of Friday night meditation. So the Xin Qingming says, neither chase after outer entanglements nor dwell in emptiness. And I bring this up because outer entanglements and emptiness are what this poem refers to as companions, which I found very interesting. Not opposites, not any other words you might want to think of, companions. So um, I thought about naming a cat outer entanglements so I could tell my cat Dobby, don't chase after outer entanglements. But that's a terrible name to burden a cat with. I'm kidding. Anyway, neither chase after outer entanglements nor dwell in emptiness. We can make a mistake either way. And this poem clarifies why. It says, be serene in the oneness of things and confusion will vanish of its own accord. We have lots of ideas about what serenity, serene means. I listened to um, something on NPR. Uh, Angela Davis, whom I really like, was interviewing people about solitude and their practice of solitude. And they had somebody on uh, who ran a retreat center called Pacheum Terra, which means peace on earth. It was a faith-based retreat center somewhere in Minnesota. And this woman gets on the line and she starts talking about what it means. They invited her to speak because she called in and she starts talking about what solitude means to her. And she says, she can hear the voice of God in solitude. Angela cut her right off. It's like, I think Angela got a little worried like this was going to get into some um, dicey territory uh, because the woman was talking about hearing the voice of God while in solitude. And I was very struck by how quick Angela Davis, who was an extremely good interviewer, very polite, cut her right off. She wasn't expecting to hear that. Um, so we have lots of ideas about serenity, about solitude. And the Xin Qingming says, be serene in the oneness of things and confusion will vanish of its own accord. And it says, when movement is stopped in order to get rest, this rest will itself be restless. So we're talking about human action here. We have lots of ideas about how to become serene. For example, when, move, when we have the plan, um, the intent becomes serene, by stopping movement, the Xin Qingming warns us, this rest will itself be restless. This is not true serenity. It's pointing to. And then it says, without a thorough understanding of oneness, both movement and rest will be insufficient. Very interesting. I'd never thought of it until I read this poem. We struggle and strive. We have lots of ideas about how to, what this thorough understanding of oneness, how to arrive there. Lots of ideas about how to get there. And um, uh, the Qin Ming um, has things to say about that, but I want to talk about it from the viewpoint of this poem. Without a thorough understanding of oneness, both movement and rest will be insufficient. Um, so in other words, there's the tendency to be pulled in either direction without a thorough understanding of oneness. But what is this thorough understanding of oneness? Steve's class dealt with that at great length, but I also want to read this poem. And it goes on to say, and I love this, banish reality and you fall into it. Can't get rid of wholeness, can't get rid of totality. We can make all the mistakes out of ignorance we want, but you try to banish it and you fall right into it. Um, it says, seek emptiness and you deny its nature. Another example of trying to figure out how to, how to get there. Um, and as soon as you start devising ways to move in on emptiness, you deny the nature of emptiness. We'll get to that. The poem helps with that. 
Now, here's one of the most, two of the most reassuring couplets in all of uh, Taoist literature, Zen literature, I think. The Xin Jingming says, the more talking and thinking, the further from the truth. Abandon wordiness and intellection, and there is nothing you cannot penetrate. Nothing you cannot penetrate. The poem says why. But first I wanna give you a quote. The poem is on page 111 of the Buddhist teaching of totality by Garma C.C. Chang. And the subtitle is the philosophy of Huayan Buddhism. Very dense, very dense. Um, and I had never come across this poem until Steve started talking about some stuff that was going on before the poem. So I wanna give you this quote, how are we doing distortion wise? Okay. <laughs> or something. Um, a man asked a Zen master to explain the first truth, the ultimate truth to him. The Zen master kept silent for a while and said, well, if I tell you the first truth, it will become the second truth. I think that's just a great answer. What that means is the first truth is evident and there's really nothing to say about it. It's evident and the poem makes that evident. Um, and, and, but he was invited to say something and he pointed out that anything I say is not going to be the first truth. It will be the second truth, whatever that is, but it won't be the first truth, the ultimate truth. Any questions or comments about that? We hear, we really, this teaching is not an unusual teaching in Zen. We hear this a lot. All right, let's get to the poem. Monk Shao, S-H-A-O, the outstanding disciple of Kumara Jiva. Kumara Jiva was, I think he was Indian, and he was a very famous translator of Sanskrit and Buddhist texts in Sanskrit into Chinese, is that correct? Very famous, um, did a lot of translation, a lot of work as, um, and I can, I, you know, it's in that book that Steve and I covered in um, the first part of the history class. So a lot of the works that he translated from um, Sanskrit to Chinese. Anyway, so he had disciples, Meng Shao it was his disciple. And Meng Shao illustrates the non-abiding nature of Tao in the following way. All things have their companions right and wrong, good and bad, left and right. I'm not gonna go into man and woman because that's a loaded topic. Anyway, you get the picture. All things have their companions, but Tao stands alone. Outside of Tao, there is nothing. In it, there is no duality. Without inside, without outside or inside, it includes the primordial one, and embraces the eight realms and the 10,000 things. And here we get into the companions. It is not one, not many, not dark, not bright, not arising, not ceasing, not empty, not existent, not up, not down, not construction, not deconstruction, not moving, not rest, not going, not coming, not profound, not shallow, not wise, not ignorant, not contradicting, not harmonious, not new, not old, not good, not bad, not alone, and not a pair. But why is this so? Because if you say it has an inside, it embraces the entire universe. If you say it has an outside, it accommodates 
and establishes all things. If you say that it is small, it covers wide and far. If you say that it is large, it penetrates the realm of atoms. Call it one, it bears all qualities. Call it many, its body is all void. And I want to clarify void, meaning non-substantial, meaning not, not anything that is abiding, not anything that is self arising, not anything that is substantive or unchanging, non-substant, non-substantial. That's what's meant by void here. So let me read that again. Call it one, it bears all qualities. Call it many, its body is void. Call it light, it, it is obscure and dark. Call it dark, it is illuminatingly bright. Say it arises, it has no body and no form. Say it becomes extinct, it glows for all eternity. Call it empty. It has thousands of functions. Say it exists. It is silent without shape. Call it high. It is level without form. Call it low. Nothing is equal to it. Say it constructs. It scatters all the stars. Say it destroys, things last from the days of old. Say it moves, it remains in silence. Say it stands still, it runs with all things. Say it returns, it leaves without saying farewell. Say it leaves, when the time comes, it returns. Call it deep, it mingles with all beings. Call it shallow, its roots cannot be seen. Call it poor, it has a thousand treasures and merits. Call it rich, nothing exists, nothing substantial exists in the vast ultimate. Say it is alone. It consorts with 10 myriad things, which is to say all things. Say it pairs, it is empty and alone. Therefore, Tao cannot be expressed by one name and the truth cannot be illustrated through one doctrine. Here I have only explained it very briefly for how is it possible to plumb the depth of Tao? So um, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk touch on. To some of you, this might be reminiscent of, um, well, first of all, notice that the truth, totality, wholeness, reality, cannot be pinned down. It's unpinned-downable, as Norm says. And this poem makes that point over no matter where you want to look and say, yes, that's it. This poem says, no, there's this over here. You're ignoring this over here. Um, so I love the way it does that. Um, and then it's, so it, and it also does it via negation, which reminds me of um, the Heart Sutra. Um, I'm not going to quote the Heart Sutra right now, but interestingly, after this poem, the author, Garma Chang, goes into a discussion of form is emptiness and emptiness is form, which, believe me, right now is beyond my capabilities even to approach. And that's not what I wanted to talk about anyway. But that's from the Heart Sutra. Form is emptiness and emptiness is form, yes? Okay. Um, so um, another aspect of this negation uh, for those of you who have been around Dharma Field at all, you know that uh, Steve has done teachings on um, 
what is it called? Um, I'm sorry. I'm not, when I'm not feeling well, my brain is fried. Um, what, is, what is it called in Christianity? Do unto others, okay? The maxim, do unto others. So the maxim in Christianity is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Steve teaches the negation of that. Do not do unto others what you would not have done unto you, which I think is, um, which is more comprehensive. Uh, and, there's, and there's no intention there to do anything. No intention to be whatever. Um, no intention to get anything. No, in, just an awareness of what is appropriate uh, to the situation. Do not do unto others what you would not have done unto you. So that's how this poem deals with um, wholeness, totality, reality. You point anything out, it'll say, no, 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 no. You're ignoring what's over here. Um, so let me just talk about a few things here. All things have their companions, but Tao stands alone. Outside of Tao, there is nothing. And this is not void. This is not any idea you might have about it. It's just saying that uh, there is nothing outside of Tao. Uh, as the Xin Ching Ming says, um, Perfect like great space, the way has nothing lacking, nothing extra. Um, says other things too. It says, the Xin Jing Ming says, in this not two, meaning nothing and no duality, nothing is separate, nothing is excluded. So this is pointing to that outside of Tao, there is nothing, nothing is, ex because nothing is excluded from Tao, nothing. And in it, there is no duality. There is no opposition. There is no this and that, um, that can disturb the mind. Um, without inside or out, without outside or inside, it includes the primordial one and embraces the eight realms and 10,000 things. Nothing is separate, nothing is excluded. And that's literal. And then it goes into the negations, not one, not many, not dark, not bright, not arising, not ceasing, not empty, not existent. And it goes on, um, not profound, not shallow, not wise, not ignorant. So nothing is separate, nothing is excluded, not the ignorant, not the wise, not the profound, not the shallow, um, not contradicting, not harmonious. And the, as Norm says, the fact that this is, that this is true um, is what allows all beings to manifest. This is how all beings are assisting um, in the manifestation of whatever is showing up in this moment, however Norm puts it. All beings are mutually assisting each other. This is pointing directly to that mutual assistance. It's not saying it's not this. It's not saying it's this, not that. If it's not this and not that, then all beings, everything can show up as mutually assisting. And that's how all beings can show up. I know that's very confusing. Um, and hopefully I'm not making it more confusing. Um, how am I doing? <laughs> what else is, Norm, feel free to jump in anytime. This might be a short talk. Um, after he goes through all the negations, 
not contradicting, not harmonious. And what I, well, never mind. Uh, I'm not going to go into science right now. He says, anything you say about it is not going to, it doesn't say the whole thing. Anything you say about it. Because if you say it has an inside, it embraces the entire universe. If you say it has an outside, it accommodates and establishes all things. If you say that it is small, it covers wide and far. As soon as you say anything about it, the implication is that you're ignoring the other side. You've, in order to say something about it really at all, you're, you have to ignore the other side. You cannot say the whole thing. Just as the monk points out at the beginning when he's asked to explain the first truth, the ultimate truth, really he's saying, I can't. Anything I say about it won't be the ultimate truth. It'll be the second truth, but it won't be the ultimate truth. Anything we try to say about it, just look around. And what's great about this too is it's unpinned down ability is that um, this is where the thorough understanding of oneness, we don't have to stress and strive and struggle and study and do whatever other machinations we think are necessary to understand oneness. It's unavoidable. The poem is pointing to the unavoidability of oneness. It's all pervasiveness. It says, why Jensen says interpenetrability. Um, um, it's all inclusiveness. Uh, we don't have to do anything except pay attention and be awake in this moment. That's really all we, we don't have to struggle. Steve does these interesting hand movements, you know, indicating fighting and stress, striving and struggling. And um, we don't have to do any of that because it's all right here. It's this great gift that we've been given. Um, it's reminiscent of a lot of the things we uh, study here at Dharma Field. Another thing that I found interesting, the Xin Jingming says, the moment we reverse the light, appearance and emptiness are transcended. So this is what Dogen is talking about when he says, um, learning the backward step and, and uh, to turn your light inward to illuminate yourself. He's not talking about any kind of idea of self, just learning that backward step, uh, reversing the light, um, not constantly looking outward, um, but just settling down, coming back to this moment, to wholeness, to totality, which really we've never left, never left it really, ever. Um, but we ignore that. And so we just come back to that by uh, reversing the light. Um, I can read you that directly from Dogen. Um, he says, you should therefore cease from practice based on intellectual, intellectual understanding, pursuing words and following after speech and learn the backward step that turns your light inward to illuminate yourself. So this is letting go of being caught by everything that's out there and just coming back. Because really, as this poem points out, um, Outside of Tao, there is nothing. In it, there is no duality. Without outside or inside, it includes the primordial one and embraces the eight realms and 10,000 things. So don't, there is really not inside and outside. 
but Dogen is just advising us just to come back to this moment. Just be quiet. Um, and he says, body and mind of themselves will drop away. You don't have to stress. You don't have to strive. Try to attain this. He says, if you want to attain suchness, just practice it without delay. That's what suchness is. Turning your light inward to illuminate yourself. Not getting caught by companions, one side or the other, lightness or dark, wisdom or um, ign er, ignorance, um, small or large, um, many or one. Don't get caught by that either. Um, and Dogen has to be careful because that's kind of a dangerous teaching. If you want to attain suchness, you should practice suchness without delay. He's saying, just drop it all. Drop all of that. Drop any ideas you might have about anything you might gain from turning your light inward. To just forget all that and just practice suchness. Just be fully here and now, fully present. Um, he says, this used to disturb my cousin who was a um, Japanese who studied, uh, well, he was, he had black belts and a variety of things, including the marsh, including um, calligraphy. Did you know you can get a, a black belt in calligraphy? Calligraphy is considered a martial art. And at one time he was the highest ranking Westerner in the world in calligraphy. And he had a black belt or beyond in calligraphy. And he really didn't like the idea of abandoning supernatural powers. Um, but Dogen says, it cannot be known, enlightenment, by the practicing or realizing of supernatural powers either. It must be deportment beyond one's hearing and seeing. Deportment. Deportment. That's a great word. That's an old fashioned word, isn't it? Deportment. It implies how you carry yourself, how you behave, the whole constellation of um, prop, uh, no, I hate to say the word proper, but it implies, well, let's say appropriate. Deportment beyond when it's not based on the senses either. It's just knowing who you are, knowing that there is no separation from totality, that your life is expressing the life of all beings. I'd have to say that's deportment, understanding that. Um, doesn't, it's not dependent on intelligence or the lack of it to companions. Uh, the dull and the sharp-witted, you know, we have more companions. Um, uh, Anyway, I could go on, but Dogen has to be careful because he's, he said, he's made it sound like enlightenment is ours if we're just paying attention. Um, he says, you have gained the pivotal opportunity of human form. Do not use your time in vain. And then he says, these are some of my favorite lines, besides form and substance substantiality, are like dew on the grass. Destiny, people have a lot to say about destiny. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Destiny like the dart of lightning, emptied in an instant, vanished in a flash. I find that so reassuring. People talk about one's destiny based on lots of things. And I'm not in any way denigrating what people are saying here, based on one's gender based on one's cultural heritage, based on one's ex socioeconomic status. And Dogen is saying, destiny is like the dart of lightning, emptied in an instant, vanished in a flash, you cannot really hold on to it. And if you do, you will suffer. That's, that's not to say that there is suffering that occurs within um, persecution or well, let me just leave it at that. Good night.
one could go on forever. Um, all right, uh, how are we doing, 10.40? I'm gonna read this last part because I really like it. Call it light, it is, it is obscure and dark. This is a reference to uh, branching streams flow in the darkness. There's a, a discussion of that, light and dark, not what we think they are. Um, uh, darkness in branching streams implies the action of totality wholeness. Is that true, do you think? Uh, whereas light, construed in um, as an opposite refers to seeing particulars, getting caught up in the particular. But darkness is the great leveler. Um, all things are equal in the dark. Uh, all things are seen as whole, as part of, to as, as totality itself. Because dark in darkness, there's not a, a picking out of anything by the light. Um, and then it says, call it dark. It is illuminatingly bright. So to realize what's being, what's being dichotomized here um, is to honor both obscurity and darkness and that which is illuminatingly bright. All is, all is, all are welcome here. <laughs> um, Say it arises, it has no body and no form. Say it becomes extinct, it glows for all eternity. That's not to say there isn't species extinction. Um, this is not to deny anything that we talk about going on in the natural world. And we're struggling to um, address um, in various ways. We call it many different things. Um, and what this is pointing to is that to address these things uh, effectively, it has to come out of a mind of wholeness, which is not striven for, which is not constructing, which is not destructing. This mind of wholeness is what's showing up all the time. It's not separate from I don't want to say our mind, that's confusing. That gets into a whole can of worms. It's not, I could, maybe I could say it's not separate from what we think. Not really. If we can make the distinction, if we can see when we're thinking, thinking has its uses, heaven knows. Um, many, many wonderful uses of thinking. So it's not negating that. It doesn't negate anything because it includes everything. Okay, I'm gonna talk maybe for a few more minutes and then I'm gonna ask some questions. Um, so that so these are the companions, the pairs, anything we might wanna say about it. Say it constructs, it scatters all the stars. I like that because of the image of the receding universe, the fact that there are the um, James Webb Space Telescope has brought us into contact with those, those Billions and billions of galaxies that seem like they're so far away, and yet it's brought it. The James Webb Telescope has brought it right back here. Say it constructs, it scatters all the stars. Say it destroys. Things last from the days of old. And this goes on. I, I've already read this. Okay. Um, but the one thing I did want to point out from the Xin Ching Ming, um, the Xin Ching Ming says, the moment we reverse the light and we stop getting caught by what's out there, appearance and emptiness are transcended. The recurring movement between apparent and empty arises only because of our ignorance. So here we have an entire poem about the recurring movement back and forth between the pairs, construction, destruction, silence, um, moving and standing still, returning and uh, 
coming back, returning and leaving, deep and shallow. Um, this beautiful, this is really very beautiful, this recurring movement between apparent and empty. The Shin Ching Ming says it arises only because of our ignorance, because we're getting caught by one of the companions and ignoring the other companion. Um, and I think this poem beautifully, I, I've puzzled over that, those lines for the longest time. Whenever I, we read the Shin Ching Ming on Friday night, the recurring movement between the parent and, and empty arises only because of our ignorance. And this poem, in my opinion, has finally addressed that, um, at least so far to my satisfaction. But you know, these things change. Um, so it's 1045. I'm going to stop. Questions, comments? Michael. There's a question about the Buddhist. Oh, the Buddhist teaching of totality. And the page the poem starts on is 111. And the author is Garma C.C. Chang. That's Garma, G-A-R-M-A, G-A-R-M-A. C, C period, C period, Chang. Of totality. Any other questions or comments? I wonder if you could uh, just really, thank you. Can I get you to look at the poem again? Yes. It's the, uh, might be the passenger to talk about small and large. Yes, and, yes. Because there's something about the way that it's um, talking about you know, how looking at it the one way seems to express the seeming opposite. Yeah, yeah yes. Really yes, that's a good way to put it. Um, it says, um, if you say that it is small, it covers wide and far. You're saying implied in saying it is small really is the opposite. Is that what you're saying? Oh, let, me, let me go on. If you say that it is large, it penetrates the realm of atoms, which to me seems a whole magnificent realm. I don't know. Is that what you meant? Yeah, and you think about that, you know, it's, I think it's a little clearer in that second, uh, that second line, but yes. it's in both. We can see that, you know, like yes. we can see that if it's large, it's, it's going to contain or it's going to be included in this one. Yes, that's true. Yes. Um, the Xin Jing Ming says, I'm sorry, I have to refer back to it because I just love what it says. It says, the infinitely small is as the infinitely great when limits are forgotten. The very large is as the very small when outlines are dissolved. <laughs> I just, I love that. Thank you for your question, that's great. Anything else? Like the day it's zero degrees, but uh, it just makes, it really makes no sense to think that you can have one in the house. Yes, 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 that's true. Yes, hot and cold is a good example. A good, a good pair, yeah. set of companions. Yeah, yeah. I love that expression. Everything has its companion. All things have their companions. Anything else? I'm sorry if I got too enthusiastic about this. I really like this poem. Also, I, I don't think we've talked about it yet here at Dharma Field. Really. Anyway. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you.